Good morning, everyone. Thanks for the introduction, Ben. Um, I'm so sorry that I can't be there with you in person this morning. Uh, I'd like to say I'm in some fantastic exotic location, but I'm right here in Brisbane. I'm just very sick. So I've got my tissues here and I'm going to keep my germs to myself this morning, um, which I'm sure you all appreciate. So we're talking about leadership of technical teams. And why is that relevant? Well, we have a skills shortage right now in the Drupal community. Um, so you may have noticed that there's a bit of a fight for talent. It's really hard to find talented Drupal developers in Australia, but it's not just affecting Drupal. It's not just affecting uh, the tech industry. It's actually the number one issue that's facing all Australian businesses at the moment. And it's a global challenge, very specifically in the tech industry. Um, Corn Ferry have estimated that by 2030, we will be at a loss of over 85 million jobs, which is huge. So the problem is not so much that robots are taking our job, as there's not enough humans to fill the jobs. So how have we ended up in this situation? Why is this happening now? Well, some people say all businesses are software businesses. We all need to use software in some form or other and that accelerates business growth. And COVID has accelerated that uh, move to digital transformation. So a lot of organizations that were thinking, well, we need to do this digitally at some point in time have gone ahead and, and started their projects and, and started their digital transformation journey. So there's a global war on talent and it's not just affecting Drupal and it's not just in Australia. So how do we solve that problem? Well, we don't have much control over the supply, but what we can do within our own organisations is create a workplace culture that will attract and keep the best employees. So that's what we're going to look at today. This is going to be relevant for you if you're a business owner, currently a team leader, aspiring to be a leader, or even if you're just looking for a great place to work or you want to improve the culture at your current workplace, we'll give you the tips and tools to look at to assess whether an organisation has a great workplace culture. Before we dive into that, just a little bit uh, Bit about me and about ATEC. So I'm the managing director of ATEC. Um, we've been involved in the Drupal community for a very long time. Um, we started out in web development um, and now we're in um, cloud hosting as well. And we've been utilizing Drupal since Drupal version five. Um, and what we do is um, web development, managed services and cloud hosting. Our data centers are right here in Queensland. And we do offer Drupal as a service and Drupal as a platform as well. Um, we focus on mission critical websites and web applications, and we work with the big end of town. So um, the likes of Virgin Australia or the Aviation Safety Authority. And oftentimes that's in partnership with different organizations. So for example, Brisbane City Council, we um, provide the cloud hosting and managed services. And we partner with um, Previous Next, who delivered the development for those sites. Um, so my technical leadership journey um, started um, a number of years ago. Um, I actually started and, and grew ATEC from scratch and it kind of happened accidentally. I've always loved tech, um, so I knew I wanted to work in tech and I went and did an IT degree. And I thought, great, I've got my degree, um, now somebody's going to hire me, um, but nobody gave me a job. Um, so I ended up working in, as a secretary in the property industry for a number of years. And um, then one day I met a very um, handsome young man and he said, quit your job and we'll go traveling around the world. So I quit my job, uh, but we didn't end up going traveling. Instead, I found myself married, pregnant and without a job. But as most of you know, if you're a geek and you don't have a job, uh, people give you work to do pretty quickly. Um, so that's what happened to me. Um, I would have done it for free because I, I love um, everything tech. Um, but uh, the people that needed help were sort of friends of friends of friends. I didn't really know them directly. 
Um, so I just started charging a low hourly rate um, building websites for um, small businesses. Um, so that sort of grew and then um, one day I thought, oh, hang on a second, I've accidentally created a full-time job for myself. I was kind of working about full-time hours and making about um, that amount of money. And in time, then uh, I needed some people to help me. So um, my leadership journey really started with my first hire, who's pictured um, right here in this um, picture in our, one of our data centres. Um, so that was the beginning of my leadership journey. Before then, I'd never managed a team um, and I really didn't know what I was doing. Um, so it was a lot of um, reading books and, and studying um, to uh, build the professional development and learn those leadership lessons along the way. So I've learned quite a bit about um, leading technical teams. Um, and nowadays, um, this is what my team looks like. So when I walk into the boardroom, these are the lovely faces um, smiling back at me. Um, and our business is actually entirely remote. So um, we've always been remote and everyone um, works from all around Australia. And this was them actually in a room together, which was unusual. Um, so uh, we've actually done really well at um, uh, creating a good culture at ATEC. Um, developer tenure is how many years do tech employees stay in your organization on average? As you can see, um, some of the, the best companies in the world don't really have great tenure for their developers. So Google, on average, developers stay only 1.1 years. Um, at ATEC, we're well above industry average. So because we had such um, good tenure of employees and we had really talented employees, they started to ask questions. So I'd go to my team and I'd say, you know, why um, have you chosen to work at ATEC? Why do you stay at ATEC? Why do you like working here? And one of the most common responses was people would say, it's the culture. We've got such a great culture. I used to think, well, what exactly is culture? What does that mean? Um, so I started to ask more and more questions because if the culture is really good, how do we uh, make sure we protect that um, and continue to have a good culture? So that's what we're going to talk about today is your workplace, the kind of place that will attract and keep the best employees. And how can we create a culture that fosters that? Well, it turns out that usually people leave managers and not companies. So this responsibility for creating a good workplace culture actually falls to the leaders. And some people have done some fantastic research in this area. Gallup Research uh, looked at 80,000 managers at all levels in companies of all different sizes across numerous industries, and they tried to distill what makes the difference between an ordinary manager and a great manager? And a great manager is someone that can coax world-class performance out of their team. And it turns out great managers do four simple things really well. When we're talking about managers, um, this term can also apply to leaders. Um, it's just a different mindset and, and language around how we apply that. This research was specifically around managers, but it relates to leadership principles in general. Number one, select employees based on their talent and values rather than experience. Now, I'm sure you can all relate to this. If you imagine someone who has 10 years of experience but is not that great at their job, versus one of the most talented people that you've ever worked with, if you imagine them with only 12 months of experience, who would you rather hire and work with? And everyone is talented at something. So some people are really fantastic at writing code, not so good at documentation. Some people are great at documentation, but they've got terrible time management skills. Everyone has some kind of talent, so it's about really... Um, leaning in to find out what it is people love doing, what is it that they do and they lose track of time because they're so engaged with it. That's where you start to find where people's talents lie. Um, so, for example, what a lot of people look for when they're recruiting developers are soft skills. They want a coder who can do all of the other stuff, project documentation and, you know, team 
um, meeting reports, um, but maybe we just need to um, focus down and understand what are the true key talents that we're looking for and making sure you're not um, cutting out valuable talent from that pool. Number two, evaluate performance based on desired outcomes rather than direct control over the way a worker performs his or her job. So if you're dealing with talented people, they don't want to be micromanaged all of the way. So your developers in particular, you want to be breaking down the tasks to a level where they know you know, what they're supposed to be working on, but you don't need to micromanage those tasks down to a very granular level. Give them the freedom to go and work out how they're going to execute that. Three, stop trying to fix people, focus on their strengths and work around weaknesses. So we spoke about people's talents before. Have a focus around what the team can deliver rather than trying to get everything 100% with each individual team member. It's kind of like when you're building your character in an RPG, you know, everybody's going to be great in different areas, but when we work together as a team or as a party, then the team can deliver what we need to do. So what a lot of people, as I mentioned before, look for in recruitment is they're looking for um, that code that has all of these other um, skills that, you know, maybe they don't really need if they're working as part of a team. We have uh, a coder on our team who is autistic and nonverbal, so he doesn't speak at all. Um, so in terms of written communication or verbal communication, he's not a great communicator. That's not his strength. However, when we've done analysis um, on our team members, we actually found that he was the most profitable and productive member of our team by a huge margin. So the quality of result that he's delivering is so far beyond what every, everyone else is delivering because he's so good at what he does. So what we do is we pair people up with complementary skills. There's a member of our team who's fantastic at uh, written communication and absolutely obsessed with it. So as a team, we all work together and produce a quality result. And number four, find the right fit for your employee's talents. So uh, if you've got someone that's a, a great coder, well, why are we putting them into a management position? If they love being on the tools and they're great at being on the tools, let them do it. Um, find other ways to reward them for being good at that. So these things matter for talented and untalented people as well. So those people that are happy to show up to work um, and, you know, they're not doing a fantastic job, they'll be showing up for pay. Great senior management benefits. Everybody loves benefits and pay. Um, but as a leader, we want to be focused on keeping the talented resources not everybody else, you know, the quiet quitters and the ones that don't really um, care about the work they're delivering. So we look at, you know, the best place to work. An example of that is Google. It's a great place to work. We hear about all of the cool benefits. They've got pretty good pay. But, you know, best place for whom? It, it seems like their tenure is not so great, 1.1 years maybe the culture is not great for talented employees. So how do you attract, focus, and keep the most talented people, and not just everyone? Well, it turns out there are some questions you can ask, 12 questions that will help you identify a strong workplace as seen through the best employees, those talented employees. This can help you create a culture and a workplace where talented people really want to stay. So these are the 12 questions and we'll drill down into each of these. Number one, do I know what is expected of me at work? Uh, this is the first one because it's the most important. You need to know what you're supposed to be working on every day. You need to know the level of quality that's expected of you. So as a leader, make sure you're communicating that out to your team. 
Two, do I have the tools I need to do my job well? Talented people love to do a good job. So if they don't have the right tools, they're going to get frustrated. Now, this might look like, you know, uh, CI, CD tools. Um, we don't want to be giving our developers just, you know, a FTP server with no security, you know, poor uh, code editors. Give them the tools they need, regression testing tools, to make sure they can consistently deliver quality results because that's what talented people care about. They care about doing a good job. Question three, and this starts to look outside of um, what do I get to the contribution to the wider team. Three, at work, do I have the opportunity to do what I do best every day? If you've got an awesome coder, you don't want to be, you know, spending all day writing doco or spending all day in meetings. You want to be coding every day. So make sure if you're in a leadership position, you want to be creating those opportunities for talented people to do what they love and what they're good at every day. Four, in the last seven days, have I received recognition or praise for good work? Now, this is something that for me, um, I'm autistic, so um, communication is a little trickier for me. I have to continually remind myself to state the obvious. When people do a great job, I have to you know, make an effort to go and say, hey, you know, great job on that, you know, well done with that. Because too often you can get involved in your work and just um, almost feel like it's a given that people know uh, that uh, you, you think they're doing a good job, but you have to verbalise that. Um, so people are, are continually um, getting that positive feedback. And once again, this is for talented employees. Talented employees love to know that they're doing a good job. Five, does my supervisor or someone at work care for me as a person? Personally, I think this is the most important question out of all 12. If you care for the people on your team, then everything else is going to take care of itself. This goes deeper than just, you know, are they delivering good results at work? This goes to the level of, hey, you know, how are you going? What's, you know, this is this is happening at work, but is there something going on at home? Understanding um, what challenges and circumstances people are, are dealing with outside of work so that can inform how you support them at work. Six, is there someone at work who encourages my development? You know, this is about positivity. This is about belief, identifying um, latent talents in team members and encouraging them to pursue those talents. Hey, have you ever thought about doing X, Y, Z? And this can go upwards as well. You can be, you know, positively encouraging uh, people that are in leadership positions above you. Now, the next question is around belonging. And this question seven is so critical. At work, do my opinions seem to count? When you have um, team members that have a very quiet voice, you need to be the amplifier. You need to be the megaphone. You need to be spotting people when they make their contribution to really engage with that so that people have that sense that their opinions are valued. Eight, does the purpose of my company make me feel like my work is important? You may not have control over the overarching purpose of the company, but you can certainly articulate the purpose to your team members and you can articulate the purpose of an individual project and the impact that that particular project will be having on other stakeholders. So remember to engage with your team and keep them on track with the vision of why it is you're doing what you're doing. Nine, are my co-workers committed to doing quality work? There's one thing talented employees really don't enjoy and that's working with people that aren't so talented and really don't care. And I'm sure a lot of you can relate to this. Um, this is one of those ones that will really keep um, people engaged is when you're surrounded by a team of high performers, 
um, and you love what you're doing, it's a really great culture and makes you feel like you belong as a talented employee. And 10, do I have a best friend at work? If you don't have a best friend at work, why not? Is it an unfriendly culture? Um, so keep that in mind as a leader, making sure you're creating opportunities for um, people to connect socially. If you're working remotely, which most of us are doing these days, those little water cooler type conversations, we're on Discord, we're having a chat, we're talking about conspiracy theories or you know off topic stuff. Those are important because you know we're social creatures and we need to have that social connection with our team. So these questions, do I belong here? This is gonna help us build an inclusive and diverse work environment and they help people to feel valued. And that number one question is really, do my opinions seem to count? This one crops up a lot in gender discussions where women may feel that they've raised um, an opinion and it's not heard by others or people claim that opinion as their own. Um, and um, so one way to um, tackle that is to be tuned in when people give an opinion um, to call it out and and um, and mention that that person came up with um, that idea. Um, another idea is if you're in a meeting, um, you may wish to sort of call out individual people and get a contribution, get them to speak during a meeting to make sure they're giving their opinions. Is this my tribe? Does everyone look and speak the same here? Am I the odd one out? And we talk about bias and discrimination and privilege and a lot of people are sitting there thinking oh well you know does any of that really exist is it really a problem and I can assure you if you're one of those people that's thinking that it's because you have a lot of privilege and the problem with privilege is oftentimes you don't really know um, and the way you can break yourself out of that cycle is to put yourself beside a variety of people and see the world through their eyes as an example of that, one of my team members um, was in a wheelchair and it wasn't until I spent a lot of time walking around with him, booking accessible accommodation and venues for him that I started to really see. You know, th that time I, I, I wheel him home and, um, you know, the door to the hotel is a big heavy door that you have to pull backwards to get in he couldn't do that in in a wheelchair by himself even though it was an accessible hotel so it's those sort of things that I would never have known how difficult it was unless I'd walked beside him and seen the world through his eyes similarly going to the shops um, with a friend with um, quite dark skin um, and seeing how he was treated um, looking at, at jewelry and watches um, versus how I uh, get treated you can't see those challenges and those issues that people are facing every day unless you have those opportunities to walk beside them and and see the world through their eyes and similarly um, people from different cultures different backgrounds I've heard people tell me that they have to adjust their accent and speak in a different accent when they're at work because they're afraid a, that people will judge them and um, think they're less capable than they are, or, or B, that people simply won't understand them. Um, so just be mindful of, of the challenges that everybody is facing. And when we create uh, a workplace where there's a variety of different people, we've got you know different cultural backgrounds, um, different abilities, then different groups and minorities will feel like they belong as part of that tribe because the tribe is so diverse. An interesting thing to consider is the language that you're using in recruitment, particularly job ads. At ATEC, um, we had um, a requirement to maintain 51% um, um, females in a particular role because of a grant we'd received um, from the federal government. Um, so the first ad we put out um, was completely non-gendered. It didn't say anything about male or female. We got 20% um, of applicants um, were female, the rest were male. Um, and then we put the same job ad out and added um, a sentence at the bottom that said, you know, we're required to recruit female candidates for this role. 
we got the same amount of applicants the second time around, but 20% of the applicants were male um, and the rest were female. So those ratios had um, switched. But the really interesting thing was that the caliber of female applicants was just phenomenal. So they had really identified with the fact that we were looking for female candidates um, and we had some amazing responses. So keep in mind, um, the language that you're using in recruitment is going to determine whether people feel like they can relate um, uh, to the organization. And it's also going to indicate to them whether you're focused on diversity inclusion, are they going to belong and feel welcome? And the last two questions are about growth. In the last six months, have I talked with someone about my progress? Um, so am I getting check-ins on where I'm going, about you know where I want to be going? Make sure that is happening as a systematic process. 12, at work, have I had opportunities to learn and grow? Talented people, we don't want to be doing just the same thing over and over. We want to be growing and getting better and learning new things. So make sure you're giving your talented team members that opportunity for growth. And that can come in a lot of different forms. But um, firstly, you need to make sure that your organization is providing access to resources, whether it's um, training um, or at ATEC, everyone has access to LinkedIn Learning. Um, and make sure you've got time and budget for professional development. Some uh, areas for potential professional development for, um, for example, developers that want to move into more of a leadership management role, um, project management, um, process and procedure improvement if you want to head into operations, strategy and finance if you want to move into more of an executive role, and communications for everyone. If you're in a leadership position, focus on your communications. So as a leader, you're trying to find that match between what the organization wants, which is value from your team members, and what employees want, which ultimately we all kind of want to get an identity from our work. When we're at a party and someone says, what do you do? We, we want to feel good about um, what we say or we do. So identity is really important when it comes to, to de delivering value for your employees. And you can think about what everybody wants. This relates to all relationships, not just, you know, a, a, a leader, um, you know, managing um, team members. This could relate to um, customers or um, your partner at home or your children. This is what everyone needs from a relationship. And when these needs are met, we'll keep coming back to that relationship. It'll be a strong relationship. So those first three are the most important and everyone has different needs. So some people need to feel significant in a relationship. They need to feel like they're important um, and, um, you know, you can't live without uh, that relationship. Significance is important. Other people need security. They need to know that, you know, they're showing up to work or showing up to this relationship every time they know what to expect. Um, it's not going to be taken away from them. Um, other people love variety, you know, security and significance are, are not so important. They just want stuff to be, you know, interesting and changing um, every day. And once you've met um, those first three needs, then you can look at contribution and growth. In any relationship, um, people have a need to contribute. Um, so in an organization, that's about, you know, contributing to the success of, of the organization or contributing um, to uh, the health and happiness of the team or something like that. And growth, everybody needs to be growing and improving and learning. So have a think about um, that framework. If you want more information about that, that's taken from Relationship Breakthrough by Chloe Madani's and Anthony Robbins. Highly recommend um, reading that myth if i'm the best technically at doing this work that makes me a good leader wrong that makes you an expert leader expert leadership is a trap um, an expert leader thinks well i have to do this because no one else can do it as well as i can you're not willing to accept imperfection and so you create a bottleneck this is a huge risk for the organization if something happens to you no one else has been growing 
um, and learning to do what you do as well as you can do it. Um, and you're also the one that's usually in the spotlight because you're saving the day because you're so good at what you do. That's not great um, if you're a leader. If you're a true leader, this is what you need to focus on. You need to focus on stepping out of that spotlight and helping other people and coaching other people to do the task as well as you can. And the best way to do this is actually one-on-one -on -one coaching. This can be really difficult if, if you're a, a great coder, you just, you know, you're used to being they're coding away so it's a very different skill set and different mindset if you're working remote you know get on um you know teams meets whatever and screen chat even spend a whole day just sort of looking at um, somebody's screen and coaching them it's so valuable and if you've got leadership ambitions you're not currently in a leadership role it can be really difficult to break into that first role because you kind of need experience as a leader to be able to get experience as a leader so how do you break out of that and a lot of people think if they just do really well at that doing that their boss will promote them into a leadership position but that's not really true you'll often get overlooked um, for leadership if you're just really really good technically Another myth is if you're sitting there, you're thinking, well, you know, all of that culture sounds great, but I can't really do anything about that at my company. Wrong. You can be the catalyst for change. Now, somebody once said, if you want something to happen, you need to start preparing for it to happen. So the first step is to believe that this is a possibility. So whether it's that you want to step into a leadership role or you want the culture at your organization to change, you need to start preparing for that. So the person that um, said this was a success talker um, and he came home from work uh, one day and he worked in, walked into his kitchen and he tripped over a bowl of water. He said, who put this bowl of water on the floor? And his nine-year-old daughter said, uh, that's for the dog. And he said, well, we don't have a dog. And she said, yes, Dad, but you said if you want something to happen, you need to start preparing for it to happen. Um, so on and on this went. She ended up buying a lead for the dog and she was, you know, taking the imaginary dog for walks every day. And, you know, of course, soon enough, then the dog brought, then the dad brought home a, a, a new um, puppy. So this is what we need to start thinking about if we want to be in a leadership position or we want to have a great culture at work we need to start preparing as if that is actually going to happen so we're going to start thinking and acting like true leaders we're going to start thinking about our 12 questions and we're going to start creating an amazing culture so go and do it guys have fun if you have any questions comments feedbacks there's my linkedin um, so reach out that's all for me. Thanks, guys.